Our second segment is Inspection Basics. Here, we cover important points of proper inspection of airfield markings, including the inspection methods, elements, and their specific characteristics to inspect. So let's drop in. The important points of proper inspection of airfield markings, including the inspection methods, the elements, and their specific characteristics that we're trying to inspect. So let's have Mike uh, get us started with the four inspection elements um, in the airfield. Thanks, Craig. One of the uh, one of the probably the biggest issues we see with uh, on the airfields is uh, probably reflectivity. Uh, that is basically how the beads are either embedded or distributed, uh, how they're performing from a reflectivity standpoint. Uh, and some of the instruments that we've been talking about here uh, in the, over the last few uh, few slides have been really pointing those things out. And uh, again, embedment and distribution are probably the, the two components that we see that are uh, most often not as good as they could be. Uh, color is another one. Certainly, uh, you know, you imagine you know, a runway center line uh, in, at a busy airport, for example, it just gets covered. Uh, but the rest of the markings can very often be uh, marred as well by things like uh, a lot of different contaminants. We'll talk about that soon. Um, but certainly it's a, it's a good thing to look at during inspection. You also have uh, durability uh, characteristics like adhesion, for example, and then compliance with FAA or whatever governing standard it is. Things like dimension, alignment, uh, placement of the marking, those are all very important to inspect as well. Great, and I, I don't really, really have much to add here except that, you know, these are the top four of any type of pavement marking, whether it be a roadway to a runway. Uh, so if any of these, any of these four things fail, if one of them fails, the marking's not going to perform uh, as it was designed. Okay, let's go to inspection methods. So I'll kick us off here. Basically, there's three primary inspection methods. One is visual, second is handheld, and third is mobile. And we'll start with visual. And the advantages of visual is, first of all, it's convenient. There's uh, pretty much anyone with uh, knowledge or somewhat of a trained eye can can take and 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 look at that marking. Uh, it's it, you get a chance, it's also a, a visual condition assessment, so it's beyond uh, just looking at it. You can actually get down on your hands and knees. I've got several images where I'm, and I'm sure Mike does, where we're kind of on our hands and knees, kind of taking a closer look at that line, trying to figure out what might be causing the problem. Is it adhering right and so forth? So you can do a real good visual conditional assessment, uh, one that you, or condition assessment, which you really can't do with the machines because, you know, that this goes beyond um, beyond the machines. And then, of course, it can be done continuously uh, throughout uh, every time you're out on that runway, every time you're out on that taxiway, every time you're on that apron, uh, you're going to be able to do a visual inspection of some kind. And we'll talk more about that actually in, under management. Next is the handheld. The advantages of a handheld device is that you can combine it with the visual. So not only can you um, can you do your visual, but while you're there, you can use uh, a handheld instrument. It's also what's really important here is it's objective. It is a scientific assessment. Uh, it is not something of, oh, well, that line pops or that line looks bright enough or, you know, you actually have a number to go by. Uh, and uh, that's that's the critical point for roadways and runways. Um, and the other thing is with a retroreflectometer, you can do a day or night inspection uh, of that marking. So you don't normally if you're doing a visual, you have to go out there at night hit your headlights and see what it looks like and then make a subjective judgment based on that. Uh, these actually, these instruments can be used in, in the daylight when you've got your runway uh, shut down for a couple hours for your maintenance every week, that type of thing. So it doesn't have to be in a nighttime environment. And then we go to mobile and the biggest advantage of mobile, well, gosh, uh, one of the biggest is it's just fast. It's it's acquisition speed is, is tremendous. You can get out there and, and do an entire airfield and it's taxiways 
And a lot of times it's aprons and everything else. You can do those in a day or even a half a day sometimes. So they're very fast. The other thing is, is that they're, they're incredibly comprehensive. So what, what I mean by that is, is that, okay, if I take a handheld out there, I'm measuring probably, and Mike can, can chime in on this, but you know, 20 to 50 feet, I'm measuring, you know, a line. These machines are actually measuring at 400 scans. This particular one, the LLG7, is scanning with a laser 400 times per second. That means if I'm traveling 60 miles an hour down that runway and measuring an edge line, I'm measuring every two inches. That's a ton of readings. And so you're going to get a better sampling, a better understanding of what that marking is. And then the last thing uh, with the uh, when I, what I feel is a great advantage of the uh, of the mobile device is that you can use it in predictive um, in predictive man- management scheduling. So you can actually, if you do this enough times, uh, you're going to be able to say, okay, um, this this particular area on this radius is going to wear twice as fast as this other area, and therefore we're going to go ahead and schedule it to be painted twice a year rather than once a year, for example. So uh, so that's the inspection methods, visual, handheld, and mobile. And Mike, what's your take on it? Just to reiterate uh, how cool the, the equipment is, uh, both Sightline, as part of its airfield marking assessment, uses these two instruments. Uh, when we're doing a full-scale airfield marking assessment for reflectivity, uh, we use this Stripe Master 2 Touch Color uh, and the uh, LLG7A, uh, the A is for airport. Uh, the, these two devices in combination are awesome. Uh, it's, it's, we've been doing assessments for a little over 10 years, maybe almost 12 years now, um, and we adopted these in the last two years, and they're incredible. Uh, they, they give us something that we didn't have before. Greg mentioned it's fast. It's really fast. It's like a 10,000-foot-long runway. You can measure everything out there on the runway. Uh, in about uh, usually about little little less than ninety minutes, um, and uh, you know it just there's there's lots that I could go into detail, but um, they're very nice tools. What I will say is they can produce false positives, um, and it's a, it's not even that they'll give they'll tell you exactly they'll tell you accurately how that marking is performing in that instant. It does not necessarily tell you how long that marking is going to perform that way, so. For new construction, for example, you're going out and doing quality assurance testing with reflectivity and you're following the ASTM, the FAA specification. Uh, You've got all your ducks in a row and and you're getting great readings. It doesn't tell you if it's going to be that way in six months or a year. It just tells you what it is today. So the visual component of this, when Greg was saying, you know, getting getting down your hands and knees and looking at those, those beads and how they're embedded, that's key. So when you're doing quality assurance or when I'm doing marking assessment, one of the keys is to get down and you know I I again I own both of these units. They they cost a cost a pretty penny. Great investment, but uh, my eight dollar Bausch and Lomb magnifying glass is one of my you know most coveted tools. Uh, well, five times magnifying glass and, and getting down there and looking at the beads, how well they're embedded, things like that, uh, things like adhesion, durability, compliance, all of those happen in that visual inspection. Um, just one more quick note I'm going to make about, you know, from an operations standpoint, uh, airport operations, for your daily inspections, the Stripe Master 2 Touch is a great tool. Uh, for your periodic inspections, which might be airfield wide, maybe in preparation for a part 139 uh, safety inspection, that's when you use both. Uh, that's when a lot of airports give us a call and they say, hey, come out here and, and, and do an assessment for us. Uh, the ones that have done it multiple times now are starting to do what Greg mentioned, which is they're starting to spot trends. They're able to see, okay, well, this marking went from 400 millicandelas down to 250 millicandelas in about a year's time. So they're starting to be able to spot those trends. Maybe other markings were faster, particularly ones uh, like high-speed exits on a large, uh, large uh, airport, maybe runway center line, taxiway center line. Maybe those need to be maintained a little bit more frequently than, say, your edge marking on your runway or taxiway. That's the advantage you can start to maintain on an as-needed basis. That's how it will save you a lot of time and money. Great, and I would completely agree that 
really, no matter what type of inspection you do, at some point there needs to be that uh, that visual inspection uh, because a lot of times what these machines do is they'll identify that something's wrong. Uh, and when that you get that visual inspection, you'll be able to see what that something really is, what's more of what is the cause, not just the effect. All right, great. So let's move on to paint inspection. And uh, Mike, I'll let you read through this and, and get us started. Right, so as far as the paint inspection, we're really talking about uh, looking at the stripe itself, not necessarily getting real granular into the uh, into the, the bead embedment distribution, things like that. We'll talk about that next. Uh, but when you're looking at the uh, the actual stripes, you're, you're, you're taking a look at uh, compliance with either the FAA or uh, perhaps uh, Air Force, uh, UFGS, something like that. Uh, we're looking at things like dimension, alignment, configuration, uh, and all of those, those dimension and alignment criteria are not located in the 5340-1 uh, that is now uh, in May that, that, that turned into the 1M or Mike. Um, the, those, those compliance criteria are located in the 5370. And it talks about uh, dimension and alignment. Uh, they're very, they're very tight. It's about a half inch tolerance for a lot of your markings, most of your markings out there. Uh, the other thing we take a look at is adhesion. We see, and I'm going to just go out there on a limb and say that everybody listening uh, to this webinar has had some degree of chipping or peeling because I see it constantly. Um, the other thing that we see a lot is uh, the, the the color and really the quality of it, whether it's faded and faded. I think is an overused term in our in our industry. Faded by definition really means that you know the UV and, and the sun has started to deteriorate the pigments and the color of the marking itself. Uh, so many times, uh, not only in airports but inspectors and and everyone says, "Oh, the markings are faded. It's time to repaint." Uh, not necessarily true, uh, but but the sun does have an impact, particularly on reds and pinks, uh, but yellows too. They tend to lighten in color or cream. Um, by that uh, UV. Uh, and then also poor reflected color. It's something that we really don't think about. The FA doesn't really have any uh, tolerance for it, but it is very important. Greg mentioned it earlier. Sometimes a yellow line during the day is absolutely looks white at night, uh, which can cause confusion, and we're trying to reduce confusion. Uh, the other things that we're looking at with paint inspection are contrast, like our black contrast. Um, the uh, the wear, how thick the marking is, how uniform the coating is, uh, and then the contaminants. Uh, very often we talked about rubber uh, and just from traffic or from landing, uh, but also other contaminants, things like uh, mold, uh, fungus, uh, algae, rust. Uh, all of those things can impact the the quality uh, of the of the painted line itself. Great. You know, I, I think this is a great checklist uh, and pretty much covers all the major things that can go wrong with the markings. A as you mentioned about color, uh, color is kind of my pet peeve because I see it a lot on on roadways where, uh, as, as we were talking about, the, the yellow is reflecting as a white line. And, and, you know, you have, of course, in your system, you have yellow in the airfield system. You have yellow means that you're on one type or one part of the airfield and white means you're on another part. And to get those confused, especially on, uh, you know, smaller civil aviation issues or where people are, are flying in that aren't familiar with your with your airport, um, you know, there definitely it could it could be a it could be a it could be a dangerous situation. So definitely watch that retro retro reflective color. And I know your instrument, Mike, actually the mobile instrument and the handheld both uh, measure that nighttime color. So I, I think that's really a, a good uh, addition to anyone's uh, assessment. Next is uh, adhesion um, can be a big issue, especially if you're using the wrong paint. Uh, only quality waterborns have the proper resin that are designed to adhere to the concrete. And, and I get a lot of people to say, well, can I just paint over it? And I'm like, well, uh, you know, will it stick? And I, well, it'll stick to whatever it's sticking to. So if what it's sticking to is peeling up, then it's going to peel up as well. So you have to be really careful about how you uh, how you fix. And we're going to talk about some of those solutions later, but uh, how you uh, are going to um, approach a situation with peeling and bad adhesion. 
All right, let's uh, now move to, uh, Mike mentioned a little bit about beads a moment ago and said we were coming to it, and this is where we are. So bead inspection. So you're looking really at three things. Uh, is it distributed properly? Is it distributed from edge to edge of that marking properly and, and evenly? Embedment, uh, is the bead too deep or too shallow? Uh, if it's too deep, uh, it will minimize re reflectivity. Uh, and if it's too shallow, it will minimize reflectivity. It might show a yellow being white and those beads are going to roll out uh, eventually, and especially if you're using the expensive type three beads, uh, that's gonna be a bummer, because uh, you're gonna lose some money there. So, and retroreflectivity and the safety. So bead embedment is, is super important. I think Mike's gonna talk a little bit more on that, of the importance of that. And then of course, uh, the quantity, uh, you know, is there too many beads? A lot of people think, well, if one handful is good, two handfuls must be better, and that's absolutely not true. Uh, but you also have the situation with too few. And I, I have a couple comments here, a couple notes. When it comes to retroreflectivity, it's all about the beads. Well, almost. It's, it's nearly all about the beads. Uh, I often see um, uh, these issues. Most are, are um, logical, but I think that one of the easiest to misunderstand is that just because one pound does good, two pounds doesn't do better. That's probably, again, the biggest issue I see a lot of times. We were out uh, looking at some marking materials recently and uh, the, the marking material wasn't, it, he was going way too fast. He was at a line driver, you know, and uh, and he was, he was moving along pretty quick. And I said, well, you need to slow down because you need to get more paint on the ground or you're gonna have to go with a bigger tip, so on and so forth. And and so when he slowed down, well, he slowed down, but he didn't change the bead drop. And so when he did that, he was dropping way too many beads on the line. So it actually hurt the retroreflectivity of that line by doing that. Um, and I, the other thing I see, of course, is a lot of uneven distribution of those beads. And a lot of times that's because the uneven distribution of the paint or the marking material uh, it'll be thin on the edges, thick in the middle, and therefore, uh, when you drop the beads on, they all they go across the whole line, but they only embed properly in the center of that line because that's the only place that's got enough paint to do that. So I see that a lot, uh, a lot of uh, uneven distribution problems. Mike, I'll pass it over to you on that one. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, you 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 hit that last point there. Uh, we see a lot of une uneven distribution too. Um, I'm going to say, uh, based on you know some of the some of the average qualities that we look at, you know, across I don't know about seven or eight years of assessments and looking at tens of thousands of different marking samples, uh, bead embedment and distribution are essentially industry enemy number one A and one B. These two are these two qualities are rated the worst among about ten assessment criteria. When we when we're talking about visual inspection um, with our assessments, we uh, rank this the lowest most often. So embedment, I'll start there. Um, Greg mentioned that yellows can appear white uh, at night with poor embedment or when the beads sit too high in uh, up in the paint. Uh, that is exactly why, in my opinion, the FAA no longer allows us to use type three glass in red and pink paints. Uh, it is an application issue. Uh, it is not necessarily a material issue. I know this from experience. I've seen uh, really good applications that look beautiful and perfectly red at night and perfectly pink and do not wash out the inscription. Um, I have pictures of it when we when we do our symposiums. I, I get up on my soap soapbox and go on and on about it, but uh, I'll spare you today. Uh, just know that very often if, if your if your markings aren't appearing yellow at night or red at night um, it's very often uh, due to the embedment um, and that by the way that's not just type three type one can also look white at night uh, so it again it's not it's not a material issue i believe it's an application issue uh, but it is one of the things that we see uh, not done properly enough uh, airports very often don't have enough time to paint they do as much as they can in the limited window of time that they have, and that is absolutely backwards. You should try to do as, 
what you can well in the limited time you have. Uh, I know it's very difficult to get, you know, uh, you know, even on a, a, a graveyard shift, if you've got an eight hour closure, you might only get four hours of that to, to do some serious work and maybe less. Uh, Distribution is another thing. Uh, when, when Greg was talking about heavier paint in the middle and light on the outside and how that affects embedment and distribution of the marking, it's absolutely true. Uh, when we talk about runway markings, we're talking about uh, a lot of markings that are a minimum of three feet wide or perhaps six feet or 30 feet uh, in, in width. So in order to paint those water markings, you have to basically what we call gang uh, material guns together. So you might have uh, and hopefully a minimum of three. I'd prefer to see four and really my ideal is six. I'd like to see six paint guns, six bead guns, all gang side by side, all painting in concert. That is a very difficult thing to do well. Uh, very often we see that the material will start to overlap. The distribution will make the marking appear uneven, non-uniform. Um, again, uh, probably two of the, uh, the 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 you know industry enemies <laughs> number one A and one B. Tough to do well. Yeah, great. I'm glad you covered that because, uh, again, we, we see this in the roadway environment as well. Again, we're talking about that 6,000 mile assessment we just did. And and when there was a problem, you know, it was either there weren't any beads there, there were too many beads, or they were too shallow or too deep, um, or there was no marking there. That's that's a potential as well. But, um, but in most cases, again, even in the roadway environment, we find that it's beads. Thank you for joining us for our segmented video series on the Airfield Marking Assessment Quick Guide. And a special thank you to the Sightline team, who without their experience and expertise, we could not have produced such an informative presentation. Get more information on this series, case studies, tools, equipment, and services for Airfield Marking Assessments at pppcatalog.com forward slash AFM. Again, that's pppcatalog.com forward slash AFM, as in airfield markings. Thank you. Have a great day.